that's just describing a normal Wednesday to me. Get on the internet and talk about Carl Parch. <laughs> well, we're not going to make judgments this early. <laughs> But uh, ladies and gentlemen, theologians of all shapes, sizes, and theological proclivities, Travis is here, Travis, and he, he's associate professor at Linwood University, um, a Presbyterian, a ruling elder. I don't know if they also have a category of uh, servant elders, but you're not in that one. You're in a ruling one, and, and we're going to uh, discuss uh, five reasons to go Bardian, and uh, this is the second of a of a series i'm I'm trying to peer pressure people into doing giving five reasons to go something um, Monica uh, Coleman joined for uh, five reasons to go uh, process now we're going bardian and we'll we'll see we'll see what's next. I have a few that I'm working on and hopefully after after they've seen the experience of uh, of uh, uh, with a not so homebrewed friendly theologian like Carl Bart, um, they'll, they'll come on. So, uh, first, Travis, I want to know why in the world you agreed to do this. I've been asking myself the same question, Trip. Uh, why, why on earth did I agree to do this? Um, well, you and I go way back. We've crossed paths a few times on the internet, and it seemed like a good idea at the time. So here I am. But uh, as I, I made a joke earlier that getting on the internet and talking about Bart's a normal Wednesday for me. Uh, so <laughs> might as well do it with a bunch of folks from Homebrew. So uh, before, before I go on, let, why don't you let everyone know where you exist on the internet so that if, if they just need to go find a comment section on your website to vent you about or to testify to the glory of having uh, come, come to KB, uh, they know where to get it. Uh, the Evangelistian Theologian is the blog that I run. It's a multi-contributor blog at this point. It's over 10 years old now, so that's pretty exciting. And, uh, oh gosh, the URL is weird, but if you just look up uh, my, my name on Google and put in DET or something like that, you'll find it. You can find it from my Twitter profile, too. Well, I, I just want you to know, for, for, for someone that got the, got the challenge of five reasons to go something, you did what theologians like to do. They like to begin with clarifications <laughs> as to why the premise of everything they're about to do is problematic. And people may be saying that aren't theologians. Why would you give five reasons to go Bardian if you give four that just problematize the term? Nonetheless, you did. So Travis, why? Well, first, here, who in the world's Carl Bart? I, I, might, I might be sitting here having done high quality um, education in the field, not theology. And I signed on here and I want to, what is a Bardian? I'm confused. Who is Carl? And why, why would you trust anyone named Carl? Right. After Marx, how can you trust anybody named Carl? Um, uh, Karl Barth was a Protestant theologian in the 20th century primarily. He was born in 1886. He lived till 1968. Nice little bit of symmetry there. And um, he really came of age theologically during the First World War, World War and in the lead up to the First World War. And ended up um, writing a commentary shortly after the war that drew a lot of attention and building a movement that came to be known as dialectical theology there through the 20s with a number of other people uh, before he once again came to a high level of uh, public prominence in the lead up to the Second World War uh, when he was involved with the Confessing Church in Germany. And the Confessing Church in Germany were the folks who did not want to Nazify the church. And of course, there were uh, various different levels, so to speak, of uh, different ways of being in the Confessing Church. But Barthes was one of them. He was the principal author of the Barman uh, Declaration, which I may have something to say about later, and um, wrote the multi-volume, multi-part volume, what is it, 13-part volume, uh, Church Dogmatics, which has, been, uh, has become a monument to uh, Protestant dogmatics, Protestant theology in the 20th century. So he's one of those um, giants of theology who we're still trying to deal with today and make sense of and try to catch up with a bit. So one of the, one of my first experiences with Karl Barth was um, in, in divinity school. And, and, you know, sometimes you, in divinity school, I don't know if you know, the students have kind of love hate uh, reactions to theologians and they're explosive. And I decided that Karl Barth was the worst thing that had ever happened 
um, to theology, and I bought Church Dogmatics, as one does, if you're Ironically. 22 and angry, uh, and decided I was going to read the entire thing so I can know just how horrible it is. And Bart won simply out of length. Um, He'll beat you by attrition. There's just so much of it. But, uh, but he is this kind of necessary to go through character if you're doing 20th century theology. And um, as we'll hear, he's, uh, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of debate uh, around his thoughts. So when we get to a term like Bardian, uh, what do you think we have to, we, we have to get clear on? Well, this was, this was almost an existential issue for me that came up when we first started talking about doing this. We were talking just in general, hey, when did we need to do something together? And said, oh, how about five reasons to become a Bardian? I said, wait a minute, and I, am I a Bardian? <laughs> and I had to think through that a little bit, and, and it led me to reflect on the different ways that I have been a Bardian and continue to be a Bardian. It's not, it hasn't been the same uh, the whole way through. I first learned BART in, at Wheaton College when I was a Bible and Theology major at Wheaton College, and I fell in love with his dogmatic genius. And that kind of carried me along uh, through my MDiv, through my PhD in my first book, uh, just kind of being enamored with um, his, ability, his, his dogmatic insight, his way of constructing uh, uh, the intellectual history of Christian theology. But somewhere along the way, uh, things started to change for me, and I stopped being so interested in him as this towering dogmatic genius whom somehow I had to work through and figure out and um, toe the line on and plug the gaps for. Um, stopped worrying about that so much and started more to want to emulate his way of being mm -hmm. as a theologian, kind of like an existential a sort of thing to kind of inhabit the same sort of um, theologicalness uh, that Bart inhabited. And when I was thinking about what it would mean to give people reasons to go Bardian, this, this became important for me because Bart never wanted people to be Bardians. Um, a number of times he very explicitly said, hey, don't, don't be Bardians, that's not the point. He wanted people to be theologians who spoke critically and carefully about Jesus, right, in conversation with scripture and the tradition. So he wanted people to be theologians uh, with the same kind of posture that he had, the same kind of existential approach, the same kind of way of being that he had, he wasn't interested in setting himself up as kind of this uh, once for all, here's the dogmatics and now you're done sort of thing. So that, that was really my first caveat. As part wouldn't like uh, people talking about being Bardian in the sense of following his every dogmatic decision. That's not what he was in it for at all. Well, when when you uh, when you just start lumping theologians together, he gets lumped into neo orthodoxy, mm -hmm. and and you're not so uh, friendly with that lumping. <laughs> no, no, uh, being a Bardian is not about being uh, neo orthodox. The, the language of neo orthodoxy really comes um, from the English language reception of Bar, uh, and for a long time he was received in a very partial way. Uh, by way of um, early translations of a few key works, but not others, and translations that we now have serious questions about. And also, uh, he was communicated, especially in English, uh, through the work of Emil Brunner, especially early on, uh, before the Second World War. And of course, Bart and Brunner eventually had a falling out, so much of that uh, was kind of a negative association. So. Uh, calling Bart neo-orthodox is not something that he put forward, but kind of a way that he was described by other people. And, and some of those times, they meant it as a criticism. They're saying, here's Bart, uh, look at him, isn't he funny? He's walking around talking about the reformers. He thinks they're interesting for theology. He thinks they're important. He's talking about the statistics. Um, he's neo-orthodox. He's being orthodox again in a new way. Uh, but that's not what Bart wanted to do. He was not interested at all in being neo-orthodox. And there are places in the dogmatics where he rejects this kind of instruction. He says, yeah, we need to learn from all these people, uh, but that's only important uh, for us to do what they did in our own time, for us to be faithful uh, to the witness to God that Jesus has for us and that have been articulated by these folks. So the key question for him was always what needs to be said today, not what got said yesterday. That can be a helpful guide, but it's not the key question. So if we're going to talk about being Bardian, 
um, it can't just be another form of neo-orthodoxy. We can't put Bart in that position where uh, we start using him as our kind of neo-orthodoxy. Oh, we just have to get back to Bart. That's not something that Bart would have been interested in at all. So, um, you know, Matthew already commented and said that you really just think he's post-liberal. And, uh, I don't know. Me and the post-liberals don't go along. <laughs> I know. I know. It was a joke. It was a joke. Um, but, uh, but what about – how do you understand uh, him in relationship to dialectical uh, theology? And, um, and I'm looking forward to David clarifying everything <laughs> near the end. You're going to have to give me the transcript of the chat so I can go back and, uh, and uh, go over it with David and uh, see what he had to say. Uh, but the, the, the point I wanted to make about dialectical theology when it comes to what does it mean to be Bardian is Bart's um, thought did not come to us out of a vacuum. Uh, it, it didn't just spring up all on its own as uh, sui generis, as he would say, as an absolutely unique uh, kind of thing. It was part of this broader movement, and now he was at the center of this movement in the late teens and early 20s of the 19th or uh, 20th century, uh, but there were other people there too, and some of these people we know more. Um, so David Condon, as we've been saying, has uh, written a tome that he did a podcast with you on, uh, dealing with Boltmann as a dialectical theologian. Um, there are other people, uh, like uh, maybe Bonhoeffer could be put in this category in an interesting way. There's kind of, you can think of them as support staff. Uh, for Bart, you have people like Ernst uh, Wolf, uh, who would fit. You have early dialogue partners like Gogarten, and you have other people like Bruner, and even a philosopher like Eberhard Griesbach. So you've got this whole movement of folks who are thinking in a, kind of, in a way that bears a family resemblance. And this is the dialectical theology movement tied to the periodical Vision and Zeiten um, between the times. So Bart's not just doing it all on his own. He's not this towering lone figure. He's not the cowboy riding off the range all by himself to, uh, to fight uh, the cavalry or what have you of the enemy. Uh, he's, he's part of this broader movement. And so if we want to understand him well, we need to know what the concerns of this movement were, uh, what were the shared assumptions that they were working with, uh, what were the things that they rejected together, and how did each of them go about in their own way being faithful to the insights of the movement as a whole. And so if we want to talk about being Bardian, you have to be in touch uh, with dialectical theology. And in a lot of ways, I think Calling yourself a dialectical theologian makes a lot more sense than calling yourself a Bardian. But so, so what is a dialectical theologian? Yeah, that's a really good question. Well, I know that's why I asked it. I ask good questions <laughs> and expect you to give good answers. This, this is how it works, Travis. Thank I'm looking around because I've got a book up on my shelf right over there that has a great definition of what dialectical theology is in it, and I'm going to butcher it off the top of my head. But it's a definition given um, in the book that David and I edited uh, called Karl Barth in Conversation. Um, it's the idea that dialectical theology is a form of theology that tries to speak of God on the basis of encounter with the event of Jesus Christ. Uh, so it's really an existential kind of approach to what it means to be a theologian. You can't just talk about it in a disinterested way. It has to come out of um, this, uh, the, the realm of faith, which is really what encountering Jesus means. You have to have faith. And, and in that way, it comes out of uh, the church as an extension of the church's uh, worship of God. So all of that, I think, is what it means to be a dialectical theologian. But it's really keyed on that, um, doing theology out of the encounter, mm -hmm. that full encounter with Jesus Christ. And um, I know that uh, today there's a lot of people that use the word dialectic running around. A lot of them use a phrase like event uh, quite a bit. Um, for, for Bart, the dialectic and the event have um, a, a robust affirmation of God's self-revelation that's not always entailed in other you know, like theologies or philosophies of the event. Um, can, can you say a bit about kind of Bart's insistence upon – God self testimony and that, that being essential for theology because uh, I, I know a lot of people are just allergic to saying anything about God. Uh, right. Yeah, and the key thing for Bart is he's always got Horvath in the back of his head. Um, I'm sure most of the folks in the webinar know, but just in case there are a few who don't, you got Ludwig Horvath 
kind of uh, left-wing Hegelian in the late 19th century. And he comes up with this idea that religion and theology and talking about God and all of this kind of stuff, uh, you're not actually talking about anything that's different than humanity out there. You're just kind of talking about yourself. And so when you talk about God and say, God is like this, God is like that, you're just describing what you think it means to be human. And this is, this is always in the back of Barth's mind because he's worried and his main criticism um, of the theological tradition that came before him was they're not actually talking about God. They're talking about themselves. They're just projecting in this way, like Feuerbach says, and uh, we have to somehow get away from that. So Bart really wants to emphasize that when we speak of God, we're speaking of something other than ourselves. And so you've got the language of holy other, W-H-O-L-Y. L-L-Y, I can't spell. You should ask my students about the chalkboard. It's always terrible. Uh, but this holy other God that is completely different from you. Now, we don't uh, interact with that God in a vacuum. We and ourselves and our expectations and our uh, particularities as humans in particular times and places, all of that's brought up and, and tied up with it. But Bart wants to say we're really talking about something different than ourselves. And that's really what it's all about with this emphasis on God's self-revelation. It's not just, uh, pardon a little bit of French, it's not just shit we make up, as I say to, our, if, to my students. We're actually talking about uh, something that we've run into that's different from us. And, and, and so, I mean, I think part of it is uh, recognizing that it, it's an awareness of the accuracy of Auerbach that he's also affirming. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I know sometimes people that are, give theologians a hard time when you start to talk about revelation, they're like, oh, this is just uh, stuff you make up. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest challenges, uh, especially for people that aren't Bardians, uh, from Bart's thought is, uh, is the way he engages the masters of suspicion mm -hmm. and that they aren't kind of prolegomena to cat to like, to defeat so then you can get on to doing your metaphysics and then talk about essence and attributes and then get to Jesus. And if you have to do the Trinity at the end, you can, I depends <laughs> on where you are. Um, but I, it, so Bart in that sense is, uh, it remains a challenge right. uh, that theologians of all stripes deal with. Uh, it, it, it's 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 the Fleurbach with a preface from Bart. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating thing to read. You get through it to the end, and he's describing for about, and I hear a few little nits to pick with how he sets things up philosophically, but finally he gets to the end and says, hey, when it comes to doing theology, uh, you have to feel the weight of this. You can't not deal with the fact that Forbach may be right. But then he says, all you can do is laugh in his face. All you can do, in other words, is go along and keep doing your theology. You got to keep that in the back of your head, keep that danger very real, uh, for you guard against it, but still do theology by confessing in faith that you are dealing with this thing that is other than you. Mm -hmm. So uh, you kind of describe uh, three different stages of, uh, uh, of Bart's career and that part of the difficulty of figuring out what even a Bardian is, is figuring out which Bart you're a Bardianite of. Yep. And um, is there a genuine Trinitarian Bardianism? <laughs> Trinitarian Bardianism. <laughs> we, we know we're, we're all three Barts uh, mutually inform each other. You went through my, you got a couple drinks into you and you went through my notes and said, what are the, what are the fun little verbal constructions I can make out of these? I, I see how it is. Uh, it's interesting. It's, it's a little bit of a um, providential uh, happenstance that today in Princeton uh, at my alma mater, they're having what everybody is affectionately calling Bart camp which is a um, grad student colloquium uh, on BART. And they had this little icebreaker. I saw this on Twitter uh, circulating earlier. The icebreaker was, what's your BART? Question mark. And everyone had to talk about what their BART is. Um, <laughs> that can be taken a lot of different ways. <laughs> I know, you, exactly. just, you just really hope there's not like a, like a Freudian in the room or something. <laughs> right. <laughs> But, I mean, it, it came to mind in connection with this, because when you're talking about being a Bardian, you really have to ask, well, which Bart do you mean? And there are lots of different Barts. As, as you said, I kind of noted three. You've got the earliest one, who's the Saffenfield pastor. He's radic a radically deconstructive exegete, just pulling down any edifice he can get his hands on. Uh, and, you know, that could be your Bart. Uh, or then there's the Bart of the 20s and the early 30s, who's now a professor, he's trying to catch up. He hasn't done a PhD uh, in the German system. He's kind of gotten this honorary position. He has to teach himself theology, and he's diving in 
to all the historical sources and trying to figure stuff out. So maybe that's your Bart. And in fact, that's where Bart look, looks, not is not, but looks uh, most neo-Orthodox is during that period. But then you've got like maybe the mid thirties on uh, where Bart has really hit his stride as a dogmatician. And now you've got the church dogmatics and you could be a church dogmatics Bardian. So there's lots of different ways uh, that you can be Bardian and some of them uh, have emphases that are absent from the others uh, and you're dealing with the same guy. So if you're going to be Bardian, you have to think, well, which Bart am I talking about? So will you have one of them or, or amalgamation? We don't know. Um, uh, David thinks there's a fourth Bart after 2-2. Two, two. If you press uh, it, will probably come up with two or three more. Yeah, well, you know, wherever two or three Princeton grads are gathered, uh, <laughs> some Bart shall be present. <laughs> And true. Well, and maybe maybe there's multiple multiple Bart's, just like there there are multiple uh, Christologies in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, we just got to remember which ones are Gnostic ones, so we can excommunicate them. <laughs> and uh, and and I would say like the early Bart, where you're like big on the deconstruction. That's kind of the Markin Bart, where you're like you don't know about the resurrection. We don't need a conception. Don't okay. need no logos. The 20th um, Bart is the Mathean Bart. <laughs> yeah, so this is a game, I'm I, I sure. With the tradition and the sources there, working it out within the Jewish context. And then you randomly say a Bible passage was fulfilled, but it wasn't written. But when asked, you're <laughs> or, like... Well, or it's an amalgamation of Isaiah and Jeremiah or something like that. <laughs> you know, as one does um, when, when you're uh, amalgamating things. But <laughs> you, you, you have five reasons and and in the first one the first reason to go bardian is that this ain't your grandpa's double predestination my my grandpa was a was was a primitive baptist mm. his 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 double predestination was serious like you don't even know if you're among the elect so it makes makes funerals very very depressing <laughs> um, but so, so tell us, tell us how Bart is inheriting the reformed tradition. Yeah. So he's a reformed theologian. And as you know, in North America, most reformed theologian types usually get called Calvinist on some day or another. Um, but in North America, that also means this kind of, um, divergence between Calvinist and Arminian or Calvinist and Wesleyan. You get this nice little, uh, binary set up around the question of, um, do you have to make a decision uh, to get yourself saved, or have you been picked ahead of time? Um, Bart kind of blows that binary apart. He's not working within the same uh, rules as uh, that debate is working. So in a traditional double predestinarian position, you're dealing with the idea that some people appear to be saved and other people appear not to be saved. Uh, and the reason that some people appear to be saved uh, is because God has in fact saved them and God decided, well, even before God decided to make the earth in many cases, but way back when, before he actually made the earth in any case, that God was going to save those people. And then the double predestinarian comes in and says, and God actively decided not to save the other one. So that in a single predestination, God's saving some people while they're all on the way to hell. In a double predestination, God's kind of just creating them one by one and saying, this one to heaven, this one to hell, this one to heaven, this one to hell. And I don't know about you, uh, you don't look particularly shocked here on the video, uh, but it's kind of a shocking idea that God would create something just to destroy it, even if Paul might have suggested something similar. Um, I mean, it, it all depends on how high a character you're expecting your deity to have. <laughs> That's um, very true. Well, you know, if you just save one. <laughs> well, that's what Bart kind of thought. Bart kind of focused in on just one, right? Only it wasn't a just save one. It's let's save everybody or let's elect everybody uh, by way of that one. And that one is Jesus. So in, instead of doing this double predestination thing where you're looking at the level of all individuals and you're picking some individuals to go to hell and some individuals to go to heaven, uh, Bart says, God elects all individuals in Jesus so that Jesus is the one who's elected. And then the twist that makes it double predestinarian, Jesus is also the one who's rejected, the one who's reprobated, the one who's going to hell, the one who's uh, done away with. 
And this is how Bart understands uh, the cross. So on the cross and Jesus' death, this is God rejecting Jesus, and in rejecting Jesus, rejecting all human sin and destroying it. And the resurrection then means that Jesus is the elect one, so everybody is moving beyond the destruction of their sin. They are not destroyed along with the destruction of their sin. So Bart's got this uh, twofold pattern, this double pattern of electing and rejecting, but it's all focused there in Jesus. And for Bart, uh, everybody is elect in Jesus. And so he's got this um, great quote that I pulled from Church Dogmatics 2.2. Uh, Bart writes, The witness of the community of God to every individual consists in this, that he belongs eternally to Jesus Christ and is therefore not rejected, but elected by God in Jesus Christ, that the rejection which he, the individual, deserves is born and canceled by Jesus Christ. So uh, Christ is taking that place as the one rejected and as the one elected, and all the rest of the individuals, you know, are elected in him. So um, you kind of describe it as a, a reverent agnosticism on universalism. And I think a lot of people that are attracted to uh, Bart are attracted uh, initially to this. Um, and it's on page 306 because someone just asked. <laughs> um, and, and I wonder um, why feel obligated to keep the reform tradition economy of salvation in in check like uh, uh, as the terms uh, wh why what did he see as being gained by keeping um like an economy that needed uh that type of yes and no uh around yeah this this is a really tricky section of his thought and the language of reverend agnosticism which i used i steal from my uh my teacher, George Hunsinger, he's got an essay on uh, universalism and Bart, and he uses this language to describe his position, Bart's position. Um, but you're right that it, it arises within the context of a reformed soteriology and really a reformed definition of freedom. And this is really uh, the key, because within a reformed definition of freedom, you are most free when you act in a way that is consistent with your nature. It's an intellectualist position as opposed to a voluntarist one. And so the whole Calvinist versus Arminian or Calvinist versus Wesleyan debate, that all usually happens on the basis of a voluntarist account of freedom, where um, you're free when you get to arbitrarily make decisions. But for the Reformed tradition, for the intellectualist tradition, you are free when you act in accordance with your nature. And so for Bart, you're only really free when you act in accordance with your election. Now that said, he doesn't want to take salvation for granted. And this is kind of another little bit of the Reformed tradition ringing in his background, all that emphasis on divine sovereignty and God's own freedom kind of ringing back there. And Bart says, you really shouldn't uh, cash this ahead of time. You really shouldn't depend on this. Uh, you really shouldn't assume that God has to do uh, what we think God is going to do. God can always surprise us, is something that Bart likes to say. So um, he wants to say, and he, he does this on a, a pair of pages right at the end of Church Dogmatics 4.3.1, the first half of 4.3. Uh, it's, it's right at the end, a couple pages, and he says, on the one hand, uh, we can't assume that God will save everybody because it's not this metaphysical thing that's built into the world that God has to. We can't assume that God's going to, but then on the very next page, he says, basically, this is my paraphrase, but he says, we should not be surprised if he does. And that's kind of the reverent agnosticism bit. It's like, okay, God, we're not going to assume on what you can do, but given everything you've revealed about yourself to us, we kind of think that this is what's going to happen. And we won't be surprised when it is. Well, the uh, uh, is there a, you kind of, you go on to describe the role Jesus as a historical being connects to humanity and God in this uh, like free loving decision uh, to elect. Can you, can you spell that out a bit? Cause I, I think um, you're right when the American, especially evangelical debate around like the Calvinist Arminian battle is just not even framed in a way, you know what the reform tradition thinks um, generally. So you have like uh, uh, five-point Calvinists that are, are uh, 
uh, methodologically assuming like Armenian conclusions. Yeah. And anyway, go ahead. Well, the, the point about Jesus in history, I mean, so often we conceive of God as entirely outside of history. And this is really a holdover from Greek metaphysics, right? That, that I mean, that was the only game in town when our uh, forefathers and mothers in the faith, faith had to sit down and conceptually think through what it was they're saying about God and Jesus. This is what they had available to them, so it doesn't surprise us. But they had this concept of, of, a, of divinity, of a supreme divinity, absolute divinity that is untouched by time, that stands outside of time. And the interesting thing about how Bart conceptualizes um, Jesus in the incarnation is he uses the language of history. History becomes his concept. So traditionally you talk about Jesus as having two natures in one person. Uh, whereas Bart instead talks about um, the identity of two histories. That you have this human history that we use the cipher Jesus on. Everything that the human being Jesus did in life. And then you also are saying that, okay, this history that we have the cipher Jesus on is somehow also God's history. So now God's very being and God's history includes somehow at least a piece of history as we experience it, right? But then the other trick that he pulls is he says that um, Jesus' history becomes all of our history. In the awakening to faith, we're only actualizing in our own lives the outworking of Jesus' own history, so that Jesus' history comes to include our history, which means not only this tiny little 33 or whatever year bit of history uh, in, from 2,000 years ago is part of God, but even this whole continued life of faith in the church somehow has its place in God's life. Now, you've got uh, lots of different ways of dealing with this conceptually within uh, Barth studies. Uh, with, among Bardians. You've got um, some more traditional, some more uh, non-traditional, uh, but you can't get away from this idea that God has now involved God's self in history. And so through that, and this is the thing that I think is interesting to come on homebrewed Christianity uh, and talk about uh, Barth, is this actually gets you within a hailing distance of something like process theology that's so concerned with the historical process. And you do it by way of Bart through what he would call a concretely situated theology or Christology through talking about Jesus. So there are some interesting um, parallels there that I think need to be uh, explored more. Uh, and uh, it really shows that Bart is still kind of right there in the conversation for a lot of the stuff we're still discussing today. Um, one of the things that I wonder is when you talk about Jesus in human history, um, for a lot of people, the question of Jesus and human history is really hard to separate from Jesus as part of nature, uh, Earth's history as part of the cosmos. Um, how do you see the particularity or, or the kind of situated, uh, concrete situation of Jesus being connected to, to a cosmic type of consciousness? Because it, it seems like when you get to that point, it's hard not to think metaphysically. Um, and, and, you know, your next point is really resisting, uh, going there, but, uh, what does that mean? The register is for this type of statement. Um, is there, or, or is there a debate around it with Bardians that then if you are talking about human history and God's history, then the register is more of, a, a, a poetics versus, uh, cosmological or it's, uh, hermeneutical and, and th that type of, uh, concern. Right. I mean, you're asking, uh, basically, how do we have, avoid being harmfully anthropocentric uh, with this kind of an emphasis, right? We have to account for um, all of God's creation, as Christians want to define the world in which we live, and God's concern for all of it. Um, something like a Bardian way of approaching that would be to say, uh, all of our language about God has to come through this uh, event of encounter with uh, the proclaimed Jesus Christ. In proclaiming Jesus Christ, we see that um, God does not stand apart from all other things, that God, in fact, lays claim upon them, and so we start talking about God as being responsible for them, being the creator of them. And um, to me, it's 
it's really a common sense jump from there. And I'll, I'll use an analogy to Islam. So here at Lindenwood, I teach a world religion course. So we get to talk about Islam a bit. And I talk about the Islamic doctrine of creation. And unlike the Christian tradition, in Islam, you don't have a concept of original sin. You don't have a concept of uh, evil in the same way. Uh, God creates everything good, and that's it. And the logic there is kind of like, well, Allah is good. God is good. Allah is good, and Allah doesn't make any shit. Allah makes good things. And um, if, but if all of the stuff that we live in, the cre creation that we live in is good, if uh, God does not stand apart from it, there's absolutely no reason why we should stand apart from it. And uh, human beings, as uh, holding the keys to the cosmos in the sense that we can destroy it in a way that other uh, levels of life uh, cannot, uh, have a real serious responsibility to um, care for and preserve uh, the cosmos in the same way that God has shown that God cares for and preserves all that God has created. So I'm not following that one up just because I know I'm getting baited here and, and we're, we haven't even got to number two because you could go Bardian because for someone it being a metaphysics free zone is exciting. Hmm. Um, and I'd assume it's not just because you stop taking math classes and doing science is difficult. There's probably another reason. That is true though. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. <laughs> yeah. Metaphysics free zone. That's, I mean, and I, I want to talk about this by using a rhetorical device that Bart likes to use. Uh, Bart likes to talk about things in theology as being both a gift and a task, both a gift and a task. So if we think about, um, Bart's theology as a non -meta or as a metaphysics free zone as a gift. Uh, this is where, and again, this, this is my amateurish opinion on process theology, but as far as I understand it, this is something that differs uh, between a Bardian approach and a process theological approach, which seems to be uh, much more bound up with um, metaphysics. So I'm very bare bones definition of metaphysics, something like. Um, reasoning about a dimension of reality on the basis of the general perception of the imminent dimension of reality. So kind of a common sense connection between what you want to talk about transcendence and then what you're talking about in terms of things you can see and interact with phenomenologically. Um, but Bart's rejection, rejection of this kind of metaphysics is all tied up with his rejection of natural theology, which is theorized in his doctrine of election. So he rejects natural theology before he comes up with his doctrine of election. But his doctrine of election theorizes it conceptually and lays um, the logic that makes sense of his rejection of natural theology. So another fun quote uh, from Church Dogmatics 2.2, and since uh, there was interest earlier, the page is page 94 uh, from Church Dogmatics 2.2. Um, Jesus is the election of God before which and without which and besides which God cannot make any other choices. So before anything else that God does, there's Jesus. So if you want to know about God, and if you want to know about everything else that God does, uh, you have to look first to Jesus, or you have to look at those things through Jesus-colored glasses, so to speak. Um, so there's no general relationship between God and creation that's apart from or other than the relationship through Jesus. And well, is, by Jesus, though, do you mean something more than just the historical person, Jesus? Like, is this connected to eternal sonship and uh, that type of thing? Or is it... In the sense that God has elected this human history to be God's own history. So this human history, everything that happens in the life of Jesus, all Jesus is speaking and acting, uh, all the faithfulness to God that Jesus displays, this is what stands at the beginning. And there's no way to get to God by circumventing that. You can't go around it. You can't go under it. You can't go above it. You have to go through it if you want to know and speak of God. And so all non-Christologically grounded God talk, any attempt to talk of and about God without talking about Jesus, uh, that's off limits for Bart. So any kind of metaphysics that wants to say, oh, uh, God created things, therefore we can talk about God on the basis of the things that God has created, none of that works for Bart. Because you can't access God without those Jesus-colored glasses. And I, am, and I think for people that, that haven't 
engage Bartolot that are sitting there going, this is just annoying me and such. Um, why can't he just be a good Logos theologian? Um, Bart has some really humorous things to say about liberals doing Logos Christology. Uh, and, and is like, no, no, the word of God is the cross and not like everything that the early church fathers thought it was. Um, you know, he's, he, so it is a, uh, he, you distinguish between metaphysics and ontology, which that just everyone that does that annoys me, even post-structuralist <laughs> Marxists that do it drives me nuts. But um, in one sense, I think the, the opening that's there is that when you get to asking the questions of ontology or metaphysics, if you can use the word and aren't allergic to it, it that it's a cruciform question. And, uh, and, and for, for Bart, and I, I wonder if the horizon of the answer is, is the same as people that would have ontological conversations or is Bart's kind of emphasis on revelation and such and the eternality of the way these type of questions are framed um, change the horizon of ontological God speak? Um, the metaphor of horizon is throwing me a bit. I think it oh, definitely you know, Princeton, I, it's very different. Uh, <laughs> we, we all use different words. I think it definitely changes the shape of, of these things. So the, the burden of the distinction between metaphysics and ontology for somebody who's a Bardian is to say we can talk about being without doing it in such a way that it's natural theology. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily easy to do that, but possible. And so you can talk about having a theological ontology, an ontology where you try to work out being and all of that kind of stuff uh, without recourse to natural theological slash metaphysical argumentation. And um, there's kind of a split within uh, Bardians, the Bart field, on this. You've got people like um, Eberhard Jungel and Bruce McCormick who think that this is a really great idea and that we need to be doing as much of this as possible, and that's what the real work is at the moment, to work out a theological ontology that makes sense within uh, Barth's framework. You've got other people who are less excited about it. So, uh, Helmut Goldwitzer, uh, not a fan of using ontology language. For him, it's much more closely associated with metaphysics, and as soon as you try to construct this kind of, what he understands to be a totalizing account, an account of being, then your theology has been, you've gotten bogged down, you've lost the event, and that's just not somewhere you want to go. Uh, today, George Hunsinger would be more in that camp. And it's been a debate for a long time. Um, Eberhard Jungel's famous book, uh, The Being of God is in Becoming, on Barth's Doctrine of God and Doctrine of Election, all the way through there, he kind of pokes fun at Goldwitzer uh, for not doing theological ontology in the way that Jungel thinks we should do it in the way he tries to do it in that book. So uh, this is still something that we're talking about. But at least theoretically, within the framework of Barth's theology. It's possible to do this kind of intellectual work as long as you don't have recourse to metaphysical slash natural theological arguments. And that's, that's part of the task. I said gift and task, this is the task. Uh, you have to now come up with a way to do theology that does not depend on these sorts of arguments. And in, in, uh, for a lot of uh, theologians, it, uh, there's a debate as to what the actual revelation is, right? Like, in why can't Christ be God's chosen revelation of God's relationship to the world or that type of relation, as opposed to the uh, event that establishes God's relationship to the world? And, and I think a lot of the frustration that theologians end up having with Bart on the surface is because they misunderstand the actual nature of the Christ event and the nature of the Trinity as he describes it and whether or not you end up liking it or not. Um, th there is a sense to uh, the cohesiveness of an argument that a lot of times gets uh, just packaged up to be dismissed early um, when what he's trying to do. And I think that's what you're describing the task is to you know, like, let's describe the world theology ourselves as God has given it to us in Christ. And that this event and this election uh, and the ontology, which you you describe in coming out of the actual being of God, uh, the triune God and things, is uh, in a, an, a really an aggressive 
uh, affront to the hubris that many uh, theologians and just critics of theologians have. Yeah. It's a, when, you, when you say you should be a Bardian because he's bringing the Trinity back, um, you know, I just get uncomfortable. I, <laughs> well, I mean, it, it probably should have been he brought the Trinity back, but I was going for some Justin Timberlake parallel there. Well, you don't have to use your words when you have a face like yours. And if people aren't watching the video and they only hear the audio, they don't know that you can sing, dance, and act. <laughs> I'm going to leave that to the side. Um, <laughs> he'd bring the Trinity back, or brought the Trinity back, right? But like, like you said, you have to understand how these doctrines are functioning for Bard. It's not just an effort to set up, here are all these concepts that we happen to have and you have to use them too. For Bart, um, all of this stuff, election, uh, trinity, Christology, they're all trying to explicate and describe um, what happens in that event of encounter with God that we were talking about. In that event with Jesus Christ proclaimed in uh, today in, in our lives. So, um, before Bart, I mean, the standard discussion goes, very few people talked about the Trinity. Very few people um, made it central uh, to their theological thinking, and we can leave to the side whether or not Bardian criticisms of Schleiermacher are entirely fair on this point. Schleiermacher famously uh, put the doctrine of the Trinity at the end of his uh, Glaubenschlera. Um, this can be seen as either a marginalization or as saying this is what it all leads to, and we can have debates about that. Uh, but after Schleiermacher leading up to Bart, Trinity wasn't very popular. And now all of a sudden after Bart, you've got people in the 20th century like Rahner and Lacuna and Boff and Moltmann and Pannenberg and Jensen and so on, who are all all of a sudden really interested in the Trinity. And this is because of Bart. Bart went ahead and stuck the doctrine of the Trinity in the very first part volume of his dogmatics. But again, Bart has to be super careful because he can't talk about the Trinity in a metaphysical way in terms of natural theology. Now, I, I mentioned before that in his Christology, he takes the idea of nature and translates it into history. Why? Because we can't assume that we know what it means to be a human being uh, before we meet Jesus. And we can't assume what, about what it means to be God before we meet Jesus. So uh, he's got to figure out a way of talking about the Trinity without making these kinds of assumptions. And this is why he rejects uh, the traditional vestigia trinitatis, the idea that in creation, there are these little fingerprints of the Trinity that you can come across and find and uh, understand God on the basis of. And I'm going to leave to the side whether that's the right way of understanding what Augustine is doing with vestigia trinitatis. I have my questions about that, but this is how it gets taken up in the tradition. But what about Schoolhouse Rock? Because there you have three is a magic number. And think of tricycles. You need three legs. To make a stool stand? That's a very compelling argument, Trip. I don't, I don't know what to do in the face of that argument, except return to my notes. Yeah, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. And that was the age of Jesus when he started his public ministry. This is true. All right, anyway, so. And yeah, uh, another three, and that's when he died. Boom. <laughs> you just vestiged. <laughs> so. You've got this problem where you can't make these kind of natural theological arguments about the Trinity. Well, what's the other solution? You just start talking about the Bible. And you say something like, well, the Bible says these words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Therefore, we need to come up with a doctrine of the Trinity. Well, that doesn't work for Bart either, right? Because for Bart, the Bible is not itself the revelation of God. The Bible tells you about the revelation of God, which you meet in Jesus. So he can't just start quoting Bible verses and constructing a doctrine of the Trinity. So he has to come up with some other kind of an approach to talk about the Trinity. And for Bart, the doctrine of the Trinity functions as a way of theorizing the event of God's self-revelation in Jesus. How do we make sense of the dynamics involved in this event of encounter? He uses the Trinity to do that. So it's, it's an attempt to sketch something like, um, to sketch an outline of God on the basis of the experience of faith. So you have this faith in Jesus, you have faith uh, in Jesus about God uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and you start putting these things together. So faith happens to you 
and then you try to figure out what it means and what this God must be like, given that faith has happened to you in this way. And this is really the exact same thing that happened with the apostles as they can, as we get conveyed in the New Testament through the proto-Trinitarian logic. They've had this experience, uh, the resurrection and all the other stuff that happens with that. They've had this experience and now they have to make sense of it and they start talking in these proto-Trinitarian terms. So that's really what it all comes from. It's a way of theorizing this event of encounter and making sense of it. So, um, uh, and, and David, David points out that this is exactly why Bart was mistaken in putting the Trinity at the start of, uh, of his dogmatics. Um, and, and, and so the, well, I just, I'll just say a word to David. D- David needs to remember that in a properly integrated dogmatics, it should not matter where you talk about any given thing. Well, can we d- talk about a book that long? As being properly integrated, I feel like this is. <laughs> David says rubbish. <laughs> so um, he and I will continue to have that argument. Oh well, you know, if, if you, you you can all arrange, we can arrange this later. Um, but that will have to be pay per view, I think. It, yeah. Um, so, you, you, can you tell me what in the world he means when he talks about the revealed, the revelation, and the revealedness? Is this a, a like a a word twist, like a, or like a theater? Uh, preparatory activities like Peter Piper, but uh, <laughs> warm up, vocal warm up. Yeah, vocal warm up. <laughs> reveal the revelation and the real, revealedness. Say it three times fast. Um, no, this is his way of theorizing uh, the event of revelation, the event of uh, faith uh, in encounter with Jesus Christ. So for Bart, uh, the Trinity is the idea that God has three modes of being, and he uses the German term Seinsweise. Um, and uh, he's using that to translate a bit of Greek uh, from the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, I'll show you how bad my pronunciation is. Tropos, Kuparkthios. Um, and this idea is that these three modes of being, and this is what makes it not modalist, the three modes of being exist simultaneously. So God always just is these three different ways of existing. And that's as the revealed, and this is God the Father, this is the thing that is revealed in the event, Then you have the revelation, the event itself, the content of it, that's Jesus or the Son. And then you have the revealedness or our engagement with this thing, and that's the Holy Spirit or the power of the revelation as it impacts us. So you're moving in this kind of trajectory from Father to Son, the Holy Spirit, which coincidentally is exactly how the Cappadocians did it in terms of the logic of causation, which they use to argue for Trinitarian equality, right? You're moving from Father through Son through Holy Spirit as it impacts us. And for Bart, this just is God, talking about God existing in these three different modes of being. So that you have this encounter with Jesus, which puts you in touch with God, and this all happens in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how faith is created in us. So, uh, so can you can you say a bit about how this ends up setting up so much of uh, uh, of the second half of the twentieth century theology? Uh, I mean, you mentioned people, you know, like Rahner and Pondenberg and such. But um, how how does the Bardian revival of the Trinity end up shaping the questions theologians thought to ask? It, it really brings the doctrine of the Trinity back to the forefront of the theological consciousness as a way of theorizing doctrine or some aspect of Christian faith. So Bart theorizes revelation this way, or the event of faith this way, as revealed reve- revelation and revealedness. Um, and then you have other folks coming along, and they start theorizing um, ecclesiology, so to speak, this way. So you want to talk about what the Christian community is supposed to be like. Well, let's talk about the interrelationships of the Trinity, right? You get social Trinitarianism. So um, I don't find Bart having a huge impact materially on all of these figures that come after him in the 20th century. But he's the one that showed them how the doctrine of the Trinity can be functional, how it can be useful in dogmatic as something other than a metaphysical a uh, puzzle that you're just supposed to believe in, right? The sacrifice of the intellect. Mm. So he puts it back on the agenda as something that's worth talking about. Well, your 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 fourth reason to go Bardian, and as a American full of freedom and liberty and all things true, 
good and beautiful. Uh, you seem to be, and maybe this is just because you live in Missouri, thinking that we need uh, anti-Nazi theology again. Yep. It looks that way. <laughs> See, here's the thing about a voluntaristic kind of freedom where you're free when you get to make arbitrary decisions. That puts you at the mercy of everybody else's arbitrary decisions. And the world devolves into nothing but a power struggle, and you end up with Nietzsche, Nietzsche right? Might makes right and all that good stuff. Um, Bart's theology is diametrically opposed to this, and it is diametrically opposed to it precisely because it's non-metaphysical. It's, uh, it rejects natural theology. So you've got the crucible of the early 1930s as Hitler is rising to power there, and you see the Nazis making use of all these sorts of concepts and symbols and ideas that are there within the German uh, psyche, many of which have been shaped by Christianity. And then you see all of these Christians supporting this stuff um, and saying, yes, this, this um, resurgent nationalism, this uh, robust muscular nationalism uh, that's going to save us somehow by asserting our national strength, uh, all of this is Christian. And so uh, you've got certain uh, political operators in the United States today who are making similar kind of arguments. You've got lots of Christians running around saying, yeah, we got to vote for this person, right? Um, but theology is designed to resist precisely that kind of thinking because if you don't think that you can look around at the world and make common, common sense assumptions about the way things are and the way God is and the way God wants it, if you can't do that, that means your theology cannot be easily co-opted by any kind of ideological agenda. So say a bit about like why he thought it was natural theology and not just German theology. Because I, mean, I think that a lot of Americans um, may not get it completely because you put him in his context and then you're like, yeah, you know, he got a little worked up, but he should because it was Hitler and you should get worked up. But, um, but can, can, you, can you isolate like why natural theology? Why not? Is it not just? Oh, this is German. Well, it was uniquely German, but it had certain formal characteristics. When um, Hitler starts talking about the true, uh, the true German people, you start essentializing uh, national identity in a way that excludes other people. So you start excluding anybody who doesn't fit your uh, essentialized definition of what a true German patriot is, so to speak. Somebody who's Jewish, somebody who's homosexual, somebody who's um, uh, mentally disabled or disabled in some other way. These people aren't properly German because they don't match the definition. All of this has to be done through these sort of common sense essentializing maneuvers. And then when you can add on top of that, common sense essentializing maneuvers about uh, who God is and what God wants by way of um, versions of Luther's, or Lutheran, not Luther's, Lutheran, orders of creation doctrine. In other words, God created the world. We look at the world and make common sense assumptions, therefore we should do X, Y, or Z or believe X, Y, or Z. So that's the sort of formal logic that Bart was trying to take off at the knees by his rejection of natural theology, saying we have to remove the conditions whereby all of this nationalist, essentializing nonsense can be easily translated right into the church without anybody batting an eye. Well, did he ever talk about Second Amendment solutions? Because I, I I don't remember this in Church Dogmatics. I'm sure David knows the passage. Um, it's probably in his eschatology. When he talks about light of the nations. Um, I'm not sure Bart would have known much about the Second Amendment. He did, however, um, shoot a flintlock rifle when he came to America when he was visiting Civil War sites. So at least in that moment, he supported the right to bear arms. Um, uh, but, I mean, I think that that whole argument is tied up, uh, the Second Amendment stuff is tied up with this for us. I don't know how many saw it, but a couple weeks ago, the NRA put out a really fascinating tweet where they said that um, people like Obama and Hillary Clinton and these people, you can't vote for them because they want to take away your God-given right to bear arms. And I actually tweeted back at them. They never responded to me. I was kind of hoping. But I tweeted no at them. No, they didn't. I tweeted at them, and I said, you know that God didn't write the, ten, uh, the, um, the Bill of Rights. The, the Bill of Rights. That's it. You know God didn't write the, the Bill of Rights. Liberal religion professor, <laughs> Bill of Rights. 
but this is the assumption that gets made. You take what seems obvious to you, what you think freedom means, and you think this is what God thinks freedom means, right? And you don't even pause to think about what you just did mentally. And that's the sort of thing that being a Bardian is supposed to uh, beat out of you one way or the other. Well, in, in a, I think one part of it, and we haven't talked about it some bit, is that uh, his th- – th- his theology has a particular kind of eschatological shape to it. So when you're talking about what is assumed to be true about the world, and that's just inherited, this kind of as-is structure of existence, um, part of the otherness of God, part of the emphasis on God's self-revelation is to say that the Christian account of the world is always this judgment of what is the case on behalf of what will be, and that to proclaim the gospel is to like to call out what is the ideological given or what's natural um Mm -hmm. and that connection of natural theology to also ideology and nationalism and such uh i think is a real important part to get uh how political his just eschatological thought is yep yep for bart um the sort of theology that he's interested in is the kind that does not accept any static orthodoxy, whether that's in political ideology, whether that's in theology, whether that's in just social organization. Um, just because a thing has been a certain way or even been a certain way for a long time doesn't mean it has to be that way. doesn't mean that's the good way for it to be. And so all of these static orthodoxies have to be destroyed uh, and attacked and um, pressed uh, with, no, with no quarter given so your your fifth reason is an aesthetic one. Uh, you said you should go Bardian because red looks good on you. And my mom agrees that red looks good on me when I'm a little more tan. Um, but <laughs> I, I was looking in my closet this morning for a red shirt, and I couldn't find a good one, so I ended up in the Presbyterian blue instead. But, but yeah, red looks good on you, Chip. Thanks. <laughs> um, Red, obviously, in this context, a dog whistle, so to speak, for socialism. Um, And this is something that I think doesn't get talked about enough in Barth's theology, especially with reference to natural theology. You can find tons of people running around who like Barth because he rejects natural theology, uh, who are not at all interested in what he had to say politically. But for Barth, so one of the real reasons where he was able to see how Christian God talk had been appropriated in favor of nationalist ideology, both in, by the Kaiser in World War I and by Hitler in World War II, was that Bart was a socialist. He ended up within a particular um, lived context where he practiced solidarity with those on the margins of society. And that gives you a whole different way of looking at society and a whole different kind of leverage for analyzing that society. So it's, it's, it was really something that funded him uh, quite a bit and enabled him um, to get his unique perspectives on what was going on. And, and for him, the question of like labor and economy and these things uh, comes out of being a pastor. Mm-hmm. And he did something, I don't know if it's taught at every seminary, but there usually is some type of advice on when you take sides in congregations or not and like when you're to be pastor and be prophetic. And it appears Bart missed that class in seminary. because yep. You said that he took the side of workers over factory owners. Yeah, so he's in Saffenville, right? You remember back to our Trinitarian Bardianism at the very beginning, the different parts. He's there in Saffenville in his church. Um, it's a country parish. And in his church, he has labor class folks. And lots of them work at a couple factories that are right nearby. And he also has the owners of the factory in the church. And Bart um, saw those owners exploiting the factory workers, saw some Christians economically exploiting other Christians. And so he caused a ruckus about that in his congregation. And eventually the factory owners left and went somewhere else. Um, But for Bart, um, this whole idea of not taking sides, I don't think that would have made sense to him at all at just a personality level but also kind of intellectually. And this is something I was thinking about uh, the other day. I forget the exact context, but there is absolutely nothing. Well, there's nothing about being balanced. There's nothing about being moderate. There's nothing about finding a middle ground 
that is a Christian virtue. Those things are not Christian virtues. They might be Aristotelian virtues. They might be Confucian virtues, but they are not Christian virtues because in the gospel, we see a God who most definitely takes sides and takes sides on behalf of those who are oppressed. And so Bart did the exact same thing as a pastor, and his theology is designed in many ways to um, encourage those of us who read it to also take those kinds of sides. Um, Goldwitzer, who I'm currently working on and working on a book on, uh, really brings this out. He has an essay called The Kingdom of God and Socialism. Um, and it's about Bart. It's really an explication of Bart's theology. And the point that Goldwitzer makes is one of the things that's going on when Bart leaves the parish and goes to the university is he's trying to elaborate a theoretical scaffold, a theological scaffolding that will support the sort of socialist practice that he thinks needs to happen. He's looking around at the socialist groups he's involved in. He's seen them kowtow to the Kaiser at time of war in Germany. And he's saying, well, that's just as bad as the capitalists doing what the, what the Kaiser wants. Right? There's something wrong with our socialist uh, theory and praxis too. So let's fix that theologically. So it's not just that capitalists need reforming, socialists need reforming too, but at least the socialists for Bart are on the right side. Well, um, my favorite Bart quote, and that's mostly because I figured you had a bunch of them, so I should find one. Um, and it is when he talks about God taking sides. He said, God always takes a stand unconditionally and passionately on this side and on this side alone, against the lofty and on behalf of the lowly, against those who already enjoy right and privilege and on behalf of those who are denied it and deprived of it. The command of God is a call for the championing of the weak against every kind of encroachment on the part of the strong. Yep, uh, wonderful. It's, well, unless you're interested in job security, so uh, as a minister, that's why we should just give a warning. I don't want anyone, um, children calling later in life because my mom and dad lost their jobs at churches for being Bardian. Um, but I mean, if we're just elaborating on Bard on this stuff, um, there's a couple places that I would I would want people to look. For instance, in Church Dogmatics 3-4, about the neighborhood of page 530, there's a section where he's talking about work, and he talks about the capitalist evaluation of work. And he makes this point where he's talking about the process of capital accumulation, and he describes it as, and this is a quote, almost unequivocally demonic. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, Marx is 100% right. But he's, what he wants to say is there's something structurally wrong with capitalism. And if you move then over to the socialist side, I've got it sitting on my lap here. Um, this is Bart's Community, State, and Church volume. And if you look in here on page 137, Bart's talking about different kinds of political options, and they're all different ways of uh, pursuing socialist policy goals. So this is the thing that we don't remember in the United States. In the United States, we hear socialist and we think Russia, or the USSR, we think China, right? These are just particular versions of socialism. There are plenty of democratic versions and plenty of different socialist ways to pursue policy goals. So it's not like you all have to get on board a 100% Marxist train if you reject capitalism, but Bart definitely thinks uh, that the socialists are the ones who are um, following the indications of the gospel and trying to take care of the least of these. Well, and, and, and I think that that activity of uh, uh, doing some high quality editing of all genuine challenges out of real testimonies from the church, uh, we've done it with Bonhoeffer in the United States. We've done it with Martin Luther King Jr. Um, where, and this I think is one of the ways where the need for that, uh, at least your first Bart who gets a little rowdy, it, it, we see that need because uh, we can turn people who should make us quake in our American empire and privilege uh, shake to the boots in front of a God who's ready to pick sides against us. We could turn them into like dissertation topics where our economic policies that continue to pillage the planet and oppress the poor remain perfectly intact. Yep. That is just nuts. The point where you were bringing up earlier about a cosmic kind of orientation, a worry about uh, the ecology uh, and uh, 
the planet and not just uh, human soteriology or anything like this. Well, I mean, if you look at, if you take a step back and look at it, the reason that the world is being pillaged and plundered is a particular economic doctrine that we call capitalism. So Barth's rejection of capitalism is another way to get into this kind of approach that wants to say, no, we have to take care of the planet. We have to pursue eco-theology. We have to take care of these um, challenges that go beyond human to human injustice. We have to talk about the injustice that we all in, uh, inhabit and live into as we subjugate our planet improperly and unjustly. So you know, as, as we're wrapping up, I, I, I think you should tell us, like if someone's listening to this and they're just saying to themselves, all right, I might actually read Karl Barth. Um, what's what, what kind? What's the what's the hit list? If you're going to send people uh, to to read them for themselves, where are you going to send them first? I've actually got a blog post on this from 2007 that they can go and look up and uh, see a def- couple different uh, reading approaches. And um, a friend of mine, Darren Sumner, has a list up or a guide up as well. But I always recommend Barth's Evangelical Theology book. These were the lectures that Bart delivered when he visited the United States toward the end of his life in the early 1960s. And um, they're very uh, accessible relative to Bart's work. Um, and they're very winsome. And um, they, they're not nearly as verbose as you get in the church dogmatics. The church dogmatics is like um, getting a big engine going. It's, spins and spins and spins around and picks up speed, and it can be a, a whole process. But these chapters are very concise, very to the point, and you don't get the bar who's the dogmatic genius. I mean, you, you get that in the background. But what you get in evangelical theology is Barth the theologian, that, that idea I was talking about before, a Barth way of being as a theologian. And so that's always where I tell people to start. Start with Barth's evangelical theology. Get the texture of the way that he lives and operates as a theologian there. It's also uh, a book that's available on Audible. So if you like audiobooks, it's um, a little under eight hours if you read or you know listen at normal speed. Which, that's that's, that's ridiculous. What the first Harry Potter book is. You should. Uh, you can if you listen to it at double speed, then um, you can just get stuck in traffic once in Los Angeles and finish the book. But it's also because it's written as lectures, it works a lot better um, as an audiobook than. I have no idea what audio version of Church Dogmatic sounds like. It's uh, hard because you have to breathe eventually. And yeah. It's just don't end sometimes. Yeah. I don't call that way in Greek. <laughs> um, and, and so the, it, the, the last question is, um, when, when you think of uh, your, your, all the different Bardians that are around, and none of the other ones have uh, a microphone right now, which one do you want to just tell them? Uh, you know, no. Which one do you want to give a nine to? You want to slap them around like email Bruner. Um, <laughs> oh, trip, 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 trip. Oh, I, I should have known that eventually you'd try to get me in trouble. Uh, I'm just inviting you to take sides because God does. <laughs> um, then to all of the Bardians who have not yet supported Black Lives Matter, who did not support Occupy Wall Street, who um, think that it might on some condition, under some conditions be acceptable to vote for people who would uh, not uphold the rights of minorities and the economically underprivileged. To all those quote unquote guardians, I want to say no and tell them that they should uh, seriously reconsider whether in fact they are guardians and perhaps they have something to confess to their Lord Jesus Christ as well. <laughs> well, I'm I'm really glad you were ambiguous with that and not direct and clear. <laughs> um, I feel like your last line might be your most tweetable one. Uh, but uh, thanks thanks a lot for for hanging out uh, on the internet, um, telling that. everyone about going Bardian, and I'll look forward to the next time we get to uh, do something like this because I have a. I have an idea I told you about. We're not telling other people about, but we'll, but we'll tell David because um, it will be a chance for him to tell everyone in public you're wrong. I know he's been looking forward to. So, uh, he's yeah, always it, looking forward to that. Oh, that's good. It's important to have those type of people in your life, um, especially ones that look so much like uh, JT. 
it's, it's hard to hard to be humble. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, thanks for having me on. I look forward to doing it again sometime, definitely. All right. Peace.